Good afternoon. My name is Ruben Cedillo Orozco. I'm the CHCI Public Policy Fellow sponsored by Bank of America. And I'm very excited to be here with today for the session on a critical moment for funding our community's progress. Coming into this session, I think about many Latinos who the, mind, the, the top of the mind issue is the economy. And then I begin to think about the 8 million Latinos that are mortgage ready and are waiting for that bit information to trickle down to them. So I'm very glad to have this conversation and to hear from a great panel of individuals who know how to seize the windows of opportunities for many Latinos. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Rosa Maria Casaneda. Rosa Maria is the director of Omdial Network, where she leads program-wide efforts to create a more inclusive and equitable future through their strategies and partnerships. Rosa Maria has a unique record of driving impact towards racial justice, economic opportunity at our four nation's largest philanthropic ventures following a decade of several of the nation's leading policy research think tanks. A child refugee to the United States, she is motivated to reimagine philanthropy, government and business, and to realize the promise of a just multiracial democracy. Please welcome Rosa Maria Casaneda. Good afternoon, everyone. Buenos, buenas tardes, mi gente. All right. Historic bipartisan economic and climate legislation. Four trillion dollars in federal resources. A fresh new ethos about government at markets alongside an unprecedented complementary investment from philanthropy totaling at least 450 million in pooled resources to unleash its highest potential and accelerate America's transition to a worker-centered, cleaner, and more equitable economy. How can we leverage this moment for Latino economic empowerment? That's the topic for the next hour. At a time when most people see Washington and the nation as hopelessly polarized, the esteemed guests on this panel and we at Omidyar Network see momentum and a potential transformative window of opportunity. I'm talking about the implementation over the next 18 months of landmark economic policies from just the last two years in the form of the 2021 American Rescue Plan, the 2021 Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the 2022 Inflation Reduction Act, and the Chips and Science Act that are designed to work together in a really important way. Central to this effort is ensuring that our Hispanic, Black, and Indigenous communities be given a shot. Who, communities that have been not had the fair shot at economic opportunities and that have sometimes been harmed by past economic policies, be given a shot to be part of the execution of this landmark legislation and to see the benefits from it. Good quality, well-paying jobs in emerging industries, access to broadband, Latino families better off and poised to finally build wealth. We at Omidy, our network, have been collaborating across economy, climate, and regional funders, plus senior leaders from the administration to help realize this. I'm delighted to introduce our expert panel. First, Ana Maria Arguilagos, President and CEO of Hispanics in Philanthropy. Tom Perez, Secretary and Director. Tom Perez, Senior Advisor to the President and Director at the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. Alex Jaquez, Jaquez uh, Special Assistant to the President for Economic Development and Industrial Strategy at the National Economic Council. And Janice Bowdler. Counselor for Racial Equity at the U.S. Department of Treasury. And I'm supposed to say, please feel free to post your comments about this session at hashtag CHCIHHM23. Good luck with that. <laughs> Let me sit down and uh, join in conversation. We hope to have a uh, conversation for about the next 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions. So thank you so much. Okay, great. Um, Mr. Uh, Director Perez. Uh, 
Ty and Tom. <laughs> I'll try to remember that. Um, let's start with you. You've called this a boon moment and a game changer for Latinos. Can you break down what's coming down the pike from this legislation and how it can meaningfully affect Latinos' lives? Well, thank you, and thank you all for being here. Thank you to CHCI for uh, convening this really important conference. And point number one to understand is where we are. I always tell people, if you don't understand the moment you're in, you're not going to take advantage of the opportunities that the moment presents. This is an unprecedented moment in our lifetime. And that is not uh, exaggeration. It's an unprecedented moment in our lifetime to address issues of opportunity, equity, inclusion, prosperity. And you see already the progress that's been made in you know, lowest unemployment rate for Latinos, highest labor force participation, uh, access to health care, the ranks of the uninsured. We still have work to do, but they're as low as ever. The list goes on, and it didn't happen by accident. It happened as a result of these unprecedented pieces of legislation. And, and in your opening remarks, you kind of answered the question that you asked me, which is the next 18 months are about implementation, implementation, implementation. You know, ARPA was local government's best friend. Here's a ton of money. You figure out how to spend it and be responsible. And responsible they were. Our mayors and county executives are some of our most important partners in this. I was in Columbus, Ohio earlier this week learning about how they're transforming communities, learning how Latinos are getting access to the building trades that they didn't previously have. And so we have to understand that ARPA was um, you know, a pretty categorical grant of money, but now we're into things like the, um, the bipartisan infrastructure legislation and the IRA, which require uh, even more engagement and partnership because you're competing for things, you're applying for things. And that's why it's so important to have philanthropy here, because one of the things that is a, a really important goal for the Biden administration is to make sure that as we implement the IRA, we're not simply rewarding communities that have really, really good grant writers. We're rewarding communities that have the most important projects, the most important need, and, and that equity lens, which has been a North Star for President Biden and Vice President Harris, continues to be that North Star. And that's why it's so important for folks, and we spend a lot of time educating people about what the Inflation Reduction Act can bring to your communities. Um, there have been so many important, between Bill and IRA, so many important projects in you know, brownfields in Miami that mm -hmm. disproportionately oh, yeah. impact Latino communities. There have been so many important investments like that. But regardless of where your organization is, if you're involved in education, like Mayor Alorsa, who is here with us, thank you for joining us, Mayor. Uh, so many opportunities that are presented in this. And don't ignore the moment. This is, you will look back in 30 years and ask yourself, when did we have the most opportunity? And I predict this will be that moment. And, and that is why we spend a lot of time in the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs working with our partners, not just in state and local governments, but uh, the business community, philanthropy, um, uh, labor, and the like, because this is a remarkably important moment. And understanding the nuance of uh, the infrastructure bill, understanding what, um, what we can do, understanding, by the way, that the 10 um, drugs that will be negotiated yeah. starting in a week or two, when you look at the underlying diseases that they treat, they disproportionately impact black and brown communities. So again, the IRA implementation of that critical um, provision was all about making sure we were looking at things through an equity lens. We've got another thing coming down the pike on health care that we need your help on, which is making sure that all folks who are on Medicaid who continue to be eligible for Medicaid are re-enrolled in Medicaid. Title 42, when it expired, we, uh, some of the provisions that um, enabled us not to have to re-enroll every year have now expired. So we've got to re-enroll. 
Now, some folks have graduated from Medicaid. That's a good thing. They're either on an ACA plan or they're on private employment. But what we know from our work is that there are a lot of folks who fall in the cracks. They don't, they're not aware that they have to uh, re-up. And uh, some states are, are doing, many states are doing really good jobs. And frankly, there's a few that, you know, are making it harder. And that's where we need your help. So when we talk about implementation, it's across a wide array of areas. Um, so many Latinos right now who are eligible to have their student loans cut in half or more. And we need your help because one thing that has happened in Congress is the um, education department needs a little bit more resources to help with um, customer service because it, it isn't a linear pathway, but they don't have the funds to do it. That's why philanthropy and others are really important partners. I could go on forever, but we've got too many good panelists here. Uh, <laughs> opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. Uh, gotta, gotta take advantage of this unprecedented moment that uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have enabled us uh, to have in this uh, post-pandemic era. Thank you, Tom. Um, really important points there about how the money is flowing from federal, but it's also flowing from states. It's flowing to governors. It's flowing to regional and uh, at the local level. Um, thank you for framing that for us. Alex, um, th it, there's a blueprint and there's an ethos uh, behind these investments about how government and markets can, t can steer in the same direction, that government can be an enabler for private industry, that can be a seed and spark additional uh, funds and investments to make America more competitive. What do you want to accomplish from your lens with these funds, and why do we need to ensure equitable deployment? Yeah, uh, thank you for that, and thank you uh, for having me uh, today. I uh, have had the privilege to um, to have been in the administration at the National Economic Council um, pretty much through the inception and then the negotiations and now the, uh, the um, implementation of the American Rescue Plan, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, Chips and Science Act, um, and the Inflation Reduction Act, and really uh, starts from a, a, a fundamental difference that the president has put forward in his economic plan. Um, the press has called it Bidenomics, uh, and we are picking it up and, and running with it. And we think that it marks a break from 40 plus years of economic orthodoxy uh, that has seen wealth inequality uh, explode, income inequality explode, has uh, led to the hollowing out of towns and communities uh, across the country as jobs moved overseas, as places lost their economic opportunity, their economic anchors uh, that really drove progress and, uh, and prosperity. Uh, in too many places, and has left, in particular, um, you know, frontline communities, fence line communities, bearing the brunt uh, of an increasing um, amount of extreme weather and pollution driven by by climate change. And so, the president, from the very beginning, articulated a different view. Instead of trickle down economics, which is the theory that if uh, the top do well, if you cut taxes and cut regulation um, and allow the market to to drive itself. Um, that eventually that wealth and, and that prosperity would, would trickle down to the middle class and the working class. Um, as the president says, you know, his, his dad never saw uh, any of that trickle down onto his kitchen table. So uh, what we are doing is, is enacting and implementing a series of, of laws and policies that we believe is going to grow the economy from the bottom up and from the middle out. Uh, and that is our, our North Star when we are, we are implementing these laws. And it starts with the American Rescue Plan, I think, a fundamentally different kind of recovery than we have ever seen from any economic um, disaster in, in, in history, in American history. Um, we've learned the lessons from, from too many recessions and too many economic downturns before. And what the president knows is that when recoveries take a long time, uh, when they are slow, when they are steady, uh, that, that the people who are, who are last in are always the first out, and then they are the last to recover again. And too often that is black and brown and indigenous uh, communities uh, across the country who uh, you know, may realize the gains of an economic expansion, and then as soon as a recession hit, all that progress is wiped away. Uh, and today, as, as the secretary said, uh, lowest unemployment rate for Latinos in history. We have more Latinos working, more Americans working today than at any time before. 
We have more Latinos, more Americans starting small businesses uh, in the United States and taking a chance on entrepreneurship and getting that lifeblood back into the economy. We have made a recovery that uh, bipartisan and, and nonpartisan organizations had told us was going to take four, five, six years and gotten back to, to where we were at pre-pandemic trends um, in, in only two. Um, but the president also articulated as, as he ran and came into office that our goal was not to get back to where we were. Right? It was to build on that and build on that and build back better. Um, and that is where the, certainly the, the investments in the infrastructure law, the climate law, and Chips and Science Act um, come in. As, as, as with economic downturns, the climate crisis has impacted uh, the least advantaged of our communities, the least advantaged of our people, the least advantaged across the world, uh, always going to be the, the ones with the fewest resources, the ones who are going to have to suffer the um, the floods, the extreme weather, the hurricanes, the disasters that we're seeing play out right now um, and are going to bear the brunt of, of any attempt to, to mitigate the, the crisis going forward. So we knew that to take an aggressive and a necessary step to address the climate crisis uh, was going to have to make sure that we were building in equity considerations uh, from the very beginning. Uh, and I think one of the most unique parts of this law so much of it is implemented through the tax code, which, uh, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, in a in a few minutes. Which is requiring to do us do things through policy and and through our implementation that we have never done before. And building in bonuses and requirements for uh, investments to flow to disadvantaged communities, to the communities that have produced oil and gas uh, and coal and and and. Um, have power plants as their, their economic drivers to make sure that, that those who are going to be hit hardest by the transition are going to be first in line for the resources that they're going to need to transition to a clean energy economy. Bonuses for paying good wages, prevailing wages, and using registered apprenticeships, making sure that we have the workforce that we're going to need uh, for the future, providing opportunities uh, in construction and in manufacturing to replace and, and recover those good jobs that we've lost over the decades. And we're seeing it happen. We're seeing manufacturing, construction, skyrocketing compared to where we were just a couple years ago. Um, and on the bipartisan infrastructure law, embedding uh, the, the the learning from the mistakes of our of our previous generations and embedding solutions into that law. I think of the uh, reconnecting communities program through the Department of Transportation as they were building out the national highway system. Uh, too often, you know, these highways were cutting right through uh, communities, Latino communities and black communities, um, slicing right through them with no community input uh, and, and often driving wedges between um, those areas of, of cities with, with opportunity and those that are going to be left behind. Uh, dedicated funding in the infrastructure law uh, so that communities could, could break down those barriers, could repurpose or, or, or demolish uh, these highway systems that have split them uh, and, and build back, again, in an inclusive uh, and, and equitable way. Um, so that has been, you know, we have, multi, we have multifaceted goals. We want to increase American independence and competitiveness on the world stage. We want to create good paying jobs, good paying union jobs across the country. And we want to fight the climate crisis. But Terrific. embedded in all of those goals is making sure that we are doing it in all of America with all Americans. Terrific. Thank you so much for that. And you previewed why we invited uh, Janice to the table. Um, the Treasury Department is responsible for a trillion of these uh, investments through the American Rescue Plan and several hundred billion uh, through the Inflation Reduction Act. You've also led uh, an equity hub at Treasury, and we want to hear from you on how is the uh, Treasury Department ensuring opportunities are intentionally broadly shared across the economy. Yeah, thank you so much for, for having me. It's great to be uh, on the panel. And I, I think what's important, I mean, we had this legislation right out the gate. I mean, we, we don't have to think back that far to remember exactly where we all were when the president took office still in the throes of COVID, still with our community, um, hitting the, um, the double-sided coin of being in, uh, most at risk of losing their jobs and most at risk of being in the jobs that were exposed to COVID. We had the dual health and economic crisis. Uh, so as this administration got going, worked with Congress to pass the American Rescue Plan, making sure that we focused on the most vulnerable and focusing on getting resources out to those communities. We did a few things. 
First of all, uh, the Treasury was responsible for standing up the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, our first nationwide eviction protection program. We've never had something like that. Uh, we worked really hard to make adjustments on the fly, make it easier for uh, prospective tenants to get the relief they need. If their landlord wasn't being responsive, then we could send payments directly to the tenant. We used fact-based proxies to reduce the, the burden. It was just, how do we make this as easy as possible? And I'll say as somebody who uh, was sitting at National Council of La Raza all through the foreclosure crisis, I can tell you that it was, it was very difficult to access foreclosure relief funds at that time. And we took those lessons and here we see the results. Two thirds of the um, of the program recipients so far uh, are extremely low income, and one third of them are Latino families. Mm. The vast majority are female headed households. Wow. So you, we can see that 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 outreach that we did uh, really mattered. We the child tax credit is another example. We slashed childhood poverty significantly when we had the advanced child tax credit. We lost that, mm -hmm. we need to get it back. But in particular, in the American Rescue Plan, when we had the advanced child tax credit for the first time, more, most of the families in um, Puerto Rico were eligible. It used to be that you had to have at least three children in order to claim the child tax credit yeah. in Puerto Rico. But under, uh, under ARPA, you only had to have one child. So now an additional, I want to make sure I get my numbers right, 250,000 families on the island were eligible for a six-fold increase. That was a six-fold increase. And the average benefit was $4,700. So it was significant. And we've repeated that. I won't go through all of the numbers, but we, we just released uh, maybe a couple of months ago the equitable recovery program that works through nonprofit loan funds called CDFIs, Community mm -hmm. Development Financial Institutions, because of the priority we placed on uh, organizations that have track records working in hardest hit communities, that that was the prioritization that we see. We, we ended up seeing far greater numbers of diverse-led organizations, and 200-plus cooperativas in Puerto Rico received funding, the largest award that the island has ever received. So the, the prioritization and how you structure even what are competitive funds to make sure that they are accessible to communities, mm -hmm. reducing those burdens that that Tom was talking about, we know the least resource places have the fewest, often have the least amount of capacity to actually apply for these funds. Right. Reducing those burdens up front has led to really strong results. So we've got those receipts. What we need to do now is take those lessons and translate them into all the ways that we're modernizing our economy. Right now, I want people to think about this, right now we are in the middle of building the middle class for the next several generations. That's what we're doing. We have our next new deal. And we know that our communities, black and brown communities in particular, have not fared well. We've not always benefited when there have been these major public yeah. investments. So what I'm thinking a lot about, and I know my colleagues are, is how do we take these lessons? We did a great job on American Rescue Plan. We have had one of the most equitable recoveries on record. Now we need to make sure that that is true for our growth stage as well. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. We've got a tremendous um, view from the administration about the way that they've set us up for success. But the other part of the equation here is how philanthropy um, can step up and support, uh, build and boost government capacity as well as prepare Latino communities, help prepare Latino communities for taking advantage of this. What's the potential, Ana Marie, for philanthropy and Latino philanthropy in this moment? And what's the risk? Thank you. I want to say thank you to Rosa, Marco Davis, both of us of you are board members, and I want to call out our HIP staff and a whole bunch of HIP leaders that are in the audience, so this is fantastic. Um, what's the potential? We need to underscore what Tom started with. Unprecedented moment in our lifetime. Actually, there's probably three generations here. Mm -hmm. I think it's like a combined, yeah. <laughs> all it's of our line. lifetimes. It's, yeah, it's like unprecedented. and. Even though that's key and so big, it's not magic, right? 
it's not magic because federal funding for too many years has failed the mark and actually has not um, really been enough in terms of funding our Latino communities. Uh, you saw this in, you've seen it in so many economic downturns in 2008, wiped out a whole generation of uh, families' wealth and um, assets. You saw that again during COVID. We again, after 10 years of building, we got wiped down again. We're the ones that suffer. And so I'm really optimistic that ARA, IRA, that ARP, all those can help for once be durable and sustainable ways to reverse these decades of um, disinvestment. Um, as important as it is, we all know that the government dollars are gonna be so important, but um, they leave gaps. And that's what I'm worried about. They leave the gaps. Uh, government, I've worked in government twice. It won't pay for any food, it won't wait for any of the stuff that we know, those of us that work in nonprofits, that you need so that you can be nimble, flexible, and really respond to the communities. It won't, I mean, this is not money that's gonna just fall on communities. It's money that they're gonna have to respond to RFPs. It's money, so they need, you know, you need somebody to write those proposals, to track those monies, it's very ca carefully, um, or you can like, wipe out a whole nonprofit that has applied and then doesn't do that well. And so all I'm trying to is express is that we need, in addition to these government dollars in our communities, we also need philanthropic dollars to make that money work. Without, that, without the philanthropic dollars, um, it has a propensity to, you just have to return the dollars. Um, <laughs> the other thing is often the, the government dollars, they don't come up front. You have to get reimbursed. So the nonprofits have to put the money in front and then get reimbursed. There's just a lot of complications. So it's not magic, although it is historic and unprecedented. And so what are we doing? At Hispanics in Philanthropy, we've been doing this for 40 years. We've been building, funding, and fueling our communities. We do this by doing a lot of research. Just yesterday, we um, put out a report, 20 years of Latino, fun, uh, of Latino giving. It shows what we all know over and over again. We did this with the Lilly School, that we are not takers, that we're givers. Just that our giving it looks very, very different. So what do we need to do? We need to make sure that through our giving, both individual giving, because you're all philanthropists, through corporate giving, because many of you represent corporate foundations, through philanthropy foundations, whether they be big foundations, community foundations, family foundations, that they are investing general, flexible dollars into our nonprofits so that they can apply for these dollars and effectively use them. If that doesn't happen, we can make a lot of damage and we don't wanna make a lot of damage. And so my plea to you is to give, give freely, give flexibly um, and help our nonprofits so that they are in a position to take advantage of these dollars, understanding that it's not just the federal dollars, that it's gonna be this beautiful weaving of the federal dollars and the philanthropic dollars, and collectively, together, that is how this is gonna work. I think there are really important points there about the administration has laid the groundwork, but we need philanthropy to weave it together so that our communities can most effectively impact. Um, uh, Secretary uh, Perez, uh, what are the most important things that you want this audience of, mm -hmm. you know, corporate leaders, corporate foundations, and uh, philanthropy to take away and to take action around coming out of this conversation? Well, the first thing is we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. uh, let me give you a very concrete example of what Anamani just said. Um, I'm spending a significant percentage of my time dealing with um, challenges that we're seeing in cities that are seeing a, a significant arrival of migrants. You know the governor of Texas is um, using, I'm trying to be polite here. Um, I'm finding it hard to be polite. Um, you know, he's using immigrants as pawns in a broader scheme to sow chaos. Immigration reform, by the way, has historically been a bipartisan issue. Yep. 
Read Ronald Reagan's last speech he gave the day before he left office. Um, a remarkable homage to immigrants and how they have built America. So I've been, I'll be in New York again Friday. I was in New York last week, and I was in New York the week before. We're all in this together. We're working with the state and the city. I met with philanthropy last week because there are things that we can do uniquely, and there are things that philanthropy can do to help fill in the gaps. We have a critical mass of people in New York that are soon to be eligible for work authorizations mm -hmm. because they came here through the CBP-1 app or they, got, they, they came here through another legal pathway and they are eligible now to apply for work but they haven't done so for a number of reasons. We're changing that. We're opening up a clinic literally next week and we're gonna be um, making 3,000 people over that two week period eligible for work authorizations. We can't do it alone. So we've got lawyers from ALA helping us out. We've got the New York Immigrant Coalition helping us out. We've got the mayor's office, the governor's office, a whole of government approach, half a dozen federal agencies. That's how we get things done uh, to tackle tough challenges. And so lesson number one, we are indeed all in this together. Lesson number two, very quickly, is these investments that my colleagues and I have described you know, in, in, in a number of these things, we're, we're not even at midfield yet. So if you're wondering, oh, am I late to the dance? The answer is heck no. Mm -hmm. There, I mean, like the, the Inflation Reduction Act, I mean, we're, we're not even at, we're nowhere near midfield. That's good news. You know, we've already gotten a number of really important projects up and running. Uh, you know, the Chips and Science Act. Uh, I was in Ohio this week, Intel. Uh, Multi-billion dollar investment there. And by the way, the Chips and Science Act, again, rewarding child care. Mm -hmm. uh, again, doing things like that. So understand that if you're thinking that, wow, I, I came too late, the answer is absolutely uh, not. And you know, I think the climate agenda has to be everybody's agenda. Mm -hmm. If we had a, a weather event that caused 150 people to die, you would say, oh my gosh, we have to declare a Stafford Act emergency right away. Well, almost 200 people have died in Phoenix this summer from extreme heat. I, I have b become very close friends with the governor of Hawaii, who is a medical doctor, by the way, and is a remarkable <laughs> human being. And we cannot solve that. The amount of investment from philanthropy in the recovery is truly inspiring. The whole of government approach to that recovery and the culturally competent underscoring by the president himself. It's not we in Washington are gonna rebuild this, you are gonna rebuild this, we're gonna rebuild this together, but we're gonna do it the way you want it. And, and as we all think about our investments, it's really important for us to have that <coughs> humility lens where we're not thinking, well, this thing worked in jurisdiction X, so let's just cut and paste and implement in jurisdiction Y. Understanding that nuance, I think, is critical to um, uh, so much of what we're accomplishing. So, you know, again, those are the things to uh, take away right now. We're all in this together. We've got plenty of uh, other things to implement over these last 18 months. And it's everybody's responsibility to have not only that equity lens, but understand how climate uh, is impacting. We, by the way, this is the largest global migration since yeah. the end of the Second World War. Yeah. And there's a host of root causes to that, one of which is climate change, which is driving people out of communities and forcing them to, you know, the, the Darien Gap, 300 people a year used to try to cross it because it was so hard to cross. So just terribly dangerous. Now we're looking at 300,000 people trying to go through there. I mean really serious challenges that I know you are up to the task on. I want to underscore that um, this uh, emerging partnership between economy and climate funders and regional funders, I mean, philanthropy doesn't much collaborate between each other and align around goals to start with. So to do so, cutting across issues and silos across economy, across climate, 
across issue-focused philanthropy and partnering with community foundations, regional, place-based focused philanthropy is something that's brand new in this effort, but we consider it critical and we consider it urgent to be able to do this, to have that as a how do we build the muscle to collaboratively deliver and show up at the table at an essential moment. Janice, I want to hear from you because you've been in corporate philanthropy. Your career has spanned nonprofits, corporate philanthropy, and now government. So what do you see as the opportunity for corporate philanthropy to partner with government, but also with the private sector? Yeah, um, well, I think my, my colleagues have, have hit on it. I mean, in this seat, uh, you know, as we think about these funding opportunities, and I was explaining that we you know, how we design to make sure that, you know, in competitive applications that we are making these programs available and accessible to the most vulnerable. And we can write it in a certain way. We can build a great mousetrap. But if there are not people on the other side to apply for those funds, they don't get delivered. Mm -hmm. They don't get delivered. And I'm going to give you a couple examples of where we are working with philanthropy right now and we're, I think, trying to strike this balance. So. One is the State Small Business Credit Initiative. So this is $10 billion that goes to states uh, to support small businesses, as the name would suggest. Two and a half billion of those funds are available to socially and economically disadvantaged individuals. States can use that money as debt. They can use it as equity investments. They can use it as loan loss guarantees. They can structure it a lot of different ways to support small businesses. The question that we asked as we put this program together, we saw all these states' programs coming together, is how do we make sure that, it's, that our community is not just getting the microloans? Like, microloans are really important. Debt is really important. But we wanted to make sure that our community is also getting the growth capital, mm -hmm. the big equity checks mm -hmm. that usually go to a certain demographic in hoodies. That's not us. Certain mice. <laughs> right? Certain non-Latino, non-black non mice. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Um, the, the venture dollars, the equity dollars are not flowing to black and brown founders. So we're working with a, a philanthropy group coordinated by Hyphen, anchored by Kellogg and JP Morgan Chase mm -hmm. to work with diverse asset managers to, mm -hmm. um, to build up the match dollars that states need mm -hmm. in order to support the flow of equity capital. And by partnering with entities that are specifically proximate and have a track record of investing in diverse founders, we think we have a better shot of directing those dollars. Another good example, and maybe to Tom's point in terms of we're just getting started, first complete rule on the uh, Inflation Reduction Act is for a program called 48 uh, Little E. Yes, we do that. We call programs by the number in the legislative code. I can tell you the real name, the Low Income Community Adder. It's not better. OK, but the, what it is is a tax credit bonus for small solar installation. OK, you, get, you already can get a tax credit for this. But now if you do it in a low income community, you get a bigger bonus. It, great. Mm challenge. First of all, we know that just locating in a low-income community does not mean that low-income people benefit, mm. either of the solar installation or the economic benefits of being the one to actually install the solar, to build the EV chargers, to deliver the batteries. And so we said, we want this program to not just make sure that solar gets to lots of places, but make sure that low-income families actually benefit that small emerging businesses that are new in this market have a chance to compete for the credit, and that the solar capacity is not limited to places where larger solar companies already exist. So we, set, uh, we had a set aside in the program that for 50% of those tax credits for projects that are led by mission-driven nonprofits that are in persistent poverty counties or for emerging businesses. Okay, I've gone and done a lot of presentations to small businesses, and I ask them, how many of you have ever applied for a tax credit? And I've never had more than three businesses raise their hand. It's hard, and it's weird. It's not easy. Even as simple as we're going to try to make it, it's not easy. And then you have the problem that Anamari mentioned, which is you might get the tax credit, but it might take a while for that to actually land. Okay, so. Here's another place where we're currently working with philanthropy to think about how do we make sure that 
churches and schools and mission-driven nonprofits can be in the position to get this credit and get this benefit? How do we make sure that this does not become extractive on our communities, but it is both helping them become more climate resilient and delivering economic benefits and keeping those economic benefits within the community? I think there are dozens more examples like that where government is doing the best they can, we are doing the best we can to create a perfect program. It's perfect. It's perfect. Okay, it's not perfect. <laughs> but I'm just going to go ahead and say it's like perfect. But if I have a perfect program that nobody knows about or they can't access because they don't have the upfront funds or they don't have grant writers, then it's just a tree falling in the forest. And that's where our philanthropy partners, our corporate partners can be a really big help. <laughs> Um, I appreciate we've uh, gone from sort of the enthusiasm and extraordinary opportunity before us to the complexity mm -hmm. of implementing this and the need for a multi-sector effort to actually get this right, to actually get the equitable outcomes from it. And now I have a little bit of inside information. I'm on HIP's board, like Ana Marie <laughs> said. So um, maybe this is a good time to talk about um, the Hispanics in Philanthropy 10 times campaign. What can you share with that? How can, what are you trying to sort of imagine in philanthropy so that we're no longer invisible and that there is an intentionality in the work that we do around reaching Latino communities. Okay. So, yes, we I'm are... I'm sorry, I'm passionate about it. No, no, we're still cooking it, so this is a good time to talk about it because we can enlist you all in the code design, which is great for you all to help us in the front end rather than the back end saying, Ana Mari, ¿por qué no pusieron esto? You know? So this is great. Um, so the 10X campaign is a campaign designed to bring about additional funding resources to our communities, all of the work that you all are doing. It's long overdue. And as I've said before, I think I said it already, but I'll say it again. I'm, it's only 1% of philanthropic dollars mm -hmm. that has been coming to our community. That's after 40 years that HIP has been tracking. It's never gone over 1%. It's often gone under to like 0.7 or 0.8. Um, so it's really, really sad. Even though we're like, keep saying this number or the lot of reports, right now we have a website that's called latinxfunders.org. Um, check it out. It tells you like all the trends and funding, where the money's going to, what it's going to, who it's going to. Who it's going to is very interesting because a lot of the money is going to organizations that are definitely not Latin, Latine led. Um, you have on the top 10, Organizations like Ducks Unlimited, that makes no sense for them to be one of the top 10 recipients. You have a lot of organizations that, I mean, Aspire Schools, KIPP Schools, that's really great, but they're definitely, they, they serve our folks, but these are, they're not building infrastructure in our communities. So that's one of my pet peeves. But what's different um, from all of the reports and all of these dashboards and all of these articles and all of these speaking opportunities, that uh, 10X campaign is, a way to increase transparency, increase accountability, but it's all of us together. Instead of HIP being like, this is a problem, this is a problem, we're doing a coordinated, multifaceted campaign, which is gonna include all of you, so all of our voices. So we're talking to all of the Latino funds all across the country, in Georgia, in California, in Denver, in, uh, I was just in Chicago last week. Uh, but it's not just the funds, it's all of the foundations, the big and small, and it's gonna be all of the organizations, all of you are part of this. It's going to, so it's going to be a multifaceted campaign that's going to be communications, and it's also going to have a research component. I want to be clear because this is the question that comes up over and over. Um, is this a new fund? It's not a new fund that HIP is doing. We have lots of funds. Tonight, if you come to um, the screening that we're going to do with Eugenio Derbez on Radical, you're all invited. It's going to be exciting. We have a new Radical fund, which is going to be for education. That's cool, but this is not a new fund. I know lots of your organizations are running new funds, are running endowments. We're not interfering with that. We want to add to that. We want to bring more money to the local level, to the state level, to the federal level. So this is increasing that, you know, what did I say? Out of the eight billion, it's only 1%. It's getting that to 5% in five years and getting it to 10% in 10 years. We're not Pollyanna. 
We know we're not going to get it to proportionality. I've had these conversations with foundation presidents. We're not going to get there, but we, you know, are going to get to 5%. 5%, mm -hmm. hey, what's 5% out of 8 billion? I forget my math, but it's a mucho dinero, a lot more than 1%. Right? It's so, called mucho dinero. It's called mucho dinero. Um, so the research is really important. Right now we're forming the steering committee. I think we have about seven, eight people on the steering committee, and uh, the fabulous folks from uh, the Rapin Group are helping us with this, and we're just really excited because it's the first time that we are proposing to do multifaceted and bringing everybody. I think that if we do this, we will have some traction. I appreciate your outlining that, and I, um, I want, I mean, we assembled this panel just so we could hear sort of the opportunities in the moment, but I really, really articulate the risks, and we need um, all sectors to show up. Um, and we've managed to do so without getting too wonky about the pieces of legislation, except for the 4080 thing over oh, there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. But, um, I'm, I'm, I wanted to, you know, I think we, two messages that we want out of this is we want this to deliver for Latino communities, again, in the form of good, well-paying jobs, being poised to build wealth uh, for Latino communities, and ultimately a vision of a reimagined capitalism. And kind of with that long-term idea and vision at the table that the um, administration has set the groundwork for, um, uh, Director Perez, can you close us out and tell us 20 years out from this moment, <laughs> how do you see investments made by the administration through these programs uh, positively impacting Latino communities across the country? Wow, well, 20 years from now, I sure hope that a lot of ITIN numbers will be replaced by social security numbers. Uh, 20 years from now, uh, I want to make sure that zip code is not determining destiny, mm -hmm. which it does for so many people. Uh, the education achievement gap that we know is persistent. Uh, we will have uh, made great steps toward eliminating that. Uh, when we have health care uh, provided by everyone, when we've finally persuaded 50 states mm -hmm. to expand mm -hmm. Medicaid, we could get up to about 98 percent coverage if we could get Florida and Texas to simply expand Medicaid. But um, we have to continue to do all this. And, and when we are fully implementing you know, IRA and we're seeing the fruits of its labor, we're seeing that uh, there are no more broadband deserts in our country. Uh, broadband deserts are uh, an obvious barrier yeah. to uh, business starts, to educational um, equity and opportunity. All of these things coming together. I mean, and, and you know, it's exactly what you said before. This is what the essence of Bidenomics is. It's about everyone getting a fair shake. It's about growing the economy from the middle out. And it's about growing the economy with a really heavy emphasis on equity, understanding that, you know, the moral Achilles heel of our nation, or at least one of them, has been our failure to ensure that all too many people who need and deserve a fair shake get that fair shake. And, and that's what all of, the, that's the connective tissue of everything that we're talking about today. You know, and in 20 years, I'm confident that dreamers are gonna be running for president and mm. governor Woo. and senator and uh, county council and uh, serving in cabinets at state and local levels. Uh, that's who we are as a nation. That's how we have always thrived as a nation. And again, I'll, I'll end where I started, which is we can't do it alone. We, we are truly all in this together. And let us not squander this unprecedented moment of opportunity. We are making tremendous progress. You know, our, 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 our democracy continues to be on fire, and it is a five-alarm blaze. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what everyone in this room has in common is most people are trained to run away from fire. You all are running toward the fire. And that's exactly what we need. Uh, because, again, we play different instruments, but we, I think, are all in the same orchestra. And that is the orchestra of you know, opportunity and accomplishment. And, 
and we're, we're, we're getting there. You know, it's a timeless journey. We the people in order to form a more perfect union. Our union was imperfect at its creation. It is imperfect today. It is a nonlinear pathway. Um, but um, as the president often says, and I agree with him a thousand percent, you know, I'm, I'm as optimistic as I've ever been because I see all of these um, investments and opportunities and partnerships at work. We, we can conquer these challenges, um, but I, I know we can't do it without all of you. So I appreciate all the time you've taken today, and more importantly, all the time you take day in and day out. Uh, and thank you for being such a wonderful host. Oh, thank you. Um, we do have some time uh, for audience um, questions. So if you have questions or ideas, please go to the mic. Good idea. Let's take two questions at a time, and we'll feel them among um, our audience or, or our panelists. Hi, my name is Joanna. I am the founder of Immigrants Beyond Immigration, and I'm a new nonprofit. I just literally got my 501c3 last month. So now it's grant, right? Like getting started. But the issue that I'm having, besides finding somebody that's good at grant writing, is you know, they want three years, five years, and it's like, we have a good product, we can change thousands of Latino lives with what we're trying to do, but how can we get to that step to somebody trusting us yeah. and being like, okay, let's start like starting funding. That's what the issue I've been yeah. seeing is that nobody wants to give that first funding, right? Terrific. So what are your recommendations for organizations like mine to you know, move forward for the next step? because that's Thank where you. we're stuck. Thank you so much. It's exciting to see you take initiative uh, to represent and make sure we get dollars to the community. Next question. Hi, my name is Jesse Bundy. I'm the Vice President of Sustainability at Dream.org, formerly known as Green for All. And we're building an inclusive green economy. Our major programming is around advocacy, uh, federal level regulatory advocacy, but also technical assistance, helping communities be able to apply for those dollars. And then also building career pathways, so scholarships and entrepreneurship for black and brown businesses and founders. Um, some of the major themes that we've come across in doing this work over the last year is that, um, and it was mentioned already, there's a lot of financial investment and risk that both businesses and community-based organizations have to take to be able to compete for federal funds. And so my question is for Tom um, specifically about how the intergovernmental process could work so that you guys are sharing information about good applications mm. that might not get funded, but where they could be shared across agencies because mm. right now there's information overload um, and communities don't know. They've spent their money maybe on one EPA grant or one DOE grant, and that's all the money they have. You know, that's going to be the end unless organizations like rush to help invest. What are ways that we as a community could help these good applications get to the right agencies to be able to be funded? Thank you. And Amadi and Tom, and we're going to have to be pretty swift because we're going to close out in just a minute or two. No, no. Um, if you're brand new and starting, um, there's, there's a couple of things. You can do crowdfunding campaigns and digital giving circle. Like HIP has a HIP Give, which is a free bilingual platform. Uh, folks that don't have development officers, I offer, often send them there because you can then, we'll help you. We have capacity building so you can develop like different campaigns and you'll develop your testimonials and your photos and things like that. So crowdfunding, uh, put yourself in front of giving circles, things like that. Once you have those advocates and those trusted community partners that love what you're doing, then you can go to your local community foundation, your local United Ways, your local funders, and then those local funders became your advocates for the bigger uh, state and national funders. Tom? Yeah, and uh, what, there's uh, two dimensions, uh, I guess, to my response. At the front end, it's important to ask questions about grant proposals so that you know exactly what people are looking for. I remember um, there was a, we did a grant proposal at the Labor Department to help uh, catalyze the employment of returning citizens. And we were pretty explicit about like we want jurisdictions to come together and you know one jurisdiction decided that no they're going to have two different mm. you know west side of the city is going to submit one east side of the city is going to submit one 
Well, you know what? Guess what? They didn't get the grant. And so, you know, really understanding at the front end and, and not being reluctant, you should reach out, you know, to the whatever the entity is in the government. And then at the back end, if you are not successful, um, you should ask for feedback. You know, there, there's always a delicate balance, but like during the process, you know, the folks who are scoring can't be giving real-time feedback because it creates a perception that, um, you know, you're trying to help one over the other. Yep. But after it's done, you should absolutely, um, hey, we had a good proposal. Can you tell us mm. what we need to do differently? Because there are often um, new rounds because what we'll find is we, we came across something really cool and there's incredible demand and we want to try and get to that next tier of folks who were incredibly worthy, but we ran out of money. So always ask for that feedback. Plan, execute, reflect, iterate, succeed. I find it amazing how uh, Tom Perez can get and speak to the paradigm level around, you know, international economic policy and competitiveness and answer an individual question about how can, you know, somebody in the front lines get access to these dollars. Um, and by the way, state po states have industrial policy coordinators also, um, in some cases, that you can go to for this. So mm -hmm. what a joy um, and what an honor to have a panel of Latino leaders at the top echelons of this administration to speak to these issues and speak directly to our communities about how we can benefit. We didn't have to search hard, and we got such an esteemed panel of experts, the great explainer, Tom Perez, <laughs> Alex Jaquez from the National Economic Council, um, and Janice doing an incredible job uh, as a Latina representing racial equity and racial justice at the Treasury Department, and Ana Marie trying to cohere uh, philanthropy to meet the moment. So thank you so much uh, for your time, and thank you everybody who's gonna, who's been, you know, listening to this on video and who will watch this on video. There's a role for everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.